Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Probably the most frightful thing is for God to stop speaking to us. And that was the case until John the Baptist came. For some 400 years, God had been silent. There had been no new prophetic voice, not since the chronicler had written down his account at the time of the kings, and Malachi recorded his prophecy of the spring or the shoot that would come forth from the stump of Jesse. And then God was quiet. People had grown anxious, they had grown, well, to wonder, was God really going to save them? And then as we read in the apocryphal books, for example, First and Second Maccabees, well, the people take matters into their own hands and try to bring about the Messiah or just appoint someone to be the Messiah over and over. Judas Maccabeus coming the closest to perhaps fulfilling that. For for a time, Rome was cast out of Jerusalem, but only for a time. But even worse, perhaps, than God being silent were those words that God had left them with. For those of you who have attended Sunday morning Bible study, you've heard how difficult a word God had spoken to them, in our case by the prophet Ezekiel. Chapter after chapter after chapter of judgment, of condemnation, of destruction, And only briefly nestled occasionally in those first 30-some chapters, some hope of a restoration, a return. Well, of course, then the end of the book and the last prophecies are of a restoration, return, a resurrection, dry bones coming together and flesh coming upon them and life being breathed into them and that fallen nation being restored again. The people had returned to Israel The nation of a sort had been restored, although under Herod and the Roman government. But where was this full restoration? Where was this resurrection? Where was this new kingdom? Why had God in his glory not once again appeared in the temple that Herod had rebuilt? And so they wondered, and they were terrified, and they took matters into their own hands rather than be patient and wait for God to accomplish what he had promised to them by way of the prophets, even those prophets in exile, Ezekiel, or the prophet in in Israel, that would have been Jeremiah, those final prophets. And then one comes, and he proclaims comfort, a baptism for repentance and the remission of sins. John the Baptist. He came to do what the prophets had long foretold. As his father himself said by the Spirit, prophesying, that's actually the first prophet restored, isn't it? He said, blessed is the Lord God of Israel, that is the lost nation, for he has already now visited and redeemed his people. Already now has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. How did Zechariah know? That Messiah that he's prophesying of, who indeed is in the womb of the Virgin Mary, has not yet even come to visit her cousin. And yet here is Zechariah by the Spirit foretelling what is already true, Mary now some three months pregnant. Just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began. This has been God's plan all along. Yes, not according to our timetable. We grow weary and anxious, waiting and wondering, is God truly going to keep his word? But he does. In his time and according to his will, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of the woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, as the apostle says. Why did he send this, this 
shoot or son from the house of the servant David, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. God has not forgotten his promises. God keeps his promises today and always. That mercy that he had promised the offspring that would crush the serpent's head as he had spoken to Eve and to the serpent and to Adam, the offspring by whom all the nations of the earth would be named as he had spoken to Abraham, the offspring, that promise again, offspring repeated to, a promise repeated, I should say, to uh, Isaac and to Jacob, has come, Zechariah says, all according to the oath, according to the promise that he swore, God swore to Abraham to be delivered from the hand of our enemies. Of course, then the question is, maybe they weren't looking for the right sort of Messiah. Were they looking for salvation from the Romans? It seems some thought that. Were they looking for salvation from an unjust taxation society, it seems that's the case for some, thus their hatred of tax collectors. Are they looking for maybe salvation from the immoral amongst them that were trying to drag them down into their sin? Maybe. But the salvation that he is speaking of is the salvation actually of each individual person, of the sin that plagues us, that's clings so tenaciously to our flesh, of death that haunts us because of our sin, and of the lies and temptations of the devil and his legion that go about trying to make shipwreck and destroy our faith. Those are the enemies that he has come to destroy, Jesus, and he has defeated them by his cross, just as he promised and swore and testified by the mouth of the prophets all those days. So we come to John. John, who is the herald and the one who comes to announce Jesus, to bring, well, the people to the knowledge and to point his finger at Jesus, Jesus who has come to save them. And so he shows himself in the wilderness just as the prophets had foretold, preaching repentance for the forgiveness of sins, baptizing unto repentance to prepare the way to level the playing field bring down the mountains and lift up the valleys, all made equally equal, that is forgiven in the name of Jesus now, and also, well, no distinction, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, even elite and middle class and lower class, all are brought to that baptism, confess their sins in repentance, and are forgiven in the blood that will flow from the Savior's side. Finally, after 400 years of silence, after devastating prophecies from well, the prophets in exile and those in the conquered lands, finally, the good news has come. And that good news is Jesus, not John. John says he must decrease that Jesus would increase. And so John's baptism gives way to Jesus' baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John himself gives way to Jesus as he is imprisoned and sends his disciples over to now follow Jesus like the sons of Zebedee. And John points to Jesus as the one in whom everything he was doing pointed towards. Even his baptism pointed to the Lamb of God, as he calls him, Jesus, who takes away the sins of the world. We can celebrate John's birthday, but especially celebrate the way that God keeps his promises, that he doesn't forget those promises, the oath he swore to Abraham, and he doesn't forget the promises he's made to you, that in your baptism he has overcome sin, death, and Satan for you, that in his body and blood on the altar you receive the Lamb of God who takes away your sins, and indeed the sins of the world. And that having been forgiven and restored and fed and nourished, heaven is, of course, not only your hope, but the oath, the promise God has made to you. That you now, as part of his church, are part of the body of Christ, part of his kingdom. That kingdom now, by faith 
and finally on the last day by sight, when you will join all the saints who have been baptized in Jesus' name, including John the Baptist. May God strengthen your faith as, John, as he strengthened John to point to Jesus. In the holy name of Jesus, amen.